Anyone who's not in the insurance industry, it's simply a case they don't understand it. They don't understand what we do, how we do it, the impact we make, uh, the great joy we can have in the day-to-day -day work we do. Uh, it's been one of the great blessings of my life and our family's life, the fact that uh, we made this transition. It's time! Work! Play! I want to connect the listeners to the best of the best. Welcome to the Evolved Broker Podcast. I'm your host, Pat Costello, the co-founder and principal at Evolve MGA. Our mission for the podcast is to bring the insurance industry the best of the best. Today, I have the pleasure of speaking to a guy that is known as the Ted Lasso of insurance. His name is Chris Might. If you haven't seen Ted Lasso with Jason Stakis on Apple Plus, I highly recommend it. The reason he is called the Ted Lasso of insurance is because he started his career in the NFL as a quarterback coach. And while Ted went from football to soccer, Chris went from football to insurance. In his seven years in the insurance industry, he's been incredibly successful. He is the president and CEO of North Risk Partners. Since he joined the firm, he has more than tripled its revenue, going from about $20 million in revenue to about $75 million in revenue. A coach at heart, Mike knows the importance of team and culture. He led the development of North Risk's core values. In our conversation, we discussed his football life and coaching with the Redskins, his transition into the business world with Walmart, his philosophy for leadership with North Risk Partners and Broad Street Partners. This episode of the podcast is sponsored by Varuna. Varuna is the future agency management system built on the number one customer relationship management tool in the world, Salesforce. Varuna allows you to customize your system, workflows, reports, dashboards, and minutes, allows you to gain actionable insights in your business in real time, letting you use this intelligence to grow your business in multiples. Varuna allows you to know your business so that you can grow your business. Please visit varuna.com to learn more. Without further ado, here's Chris. Chris, welcome to the Evolve Broker Podcast. Thank you, Patrick. Appreciate you having me. Not a problem. How are you? Well, we're doing great, but uh, it's chilly in Minnesota. <laughs> Halloween's around the corner. It's about 40 degrees and rainy. So I think you've got us beat right now. <laughs> you know, it's ironic. Um, weirdly enough, in the Bay Area, we just had something over the weekend called an atmospheric river, <clears throat> which is essentially just a downpour of rain, uh, but it seems to have cleared up. So um, anyways, interesting times with Bay Area yeah. weather. Yeah. But uh, I couldn't be more excited to, ha to have you on um, because I hear that you are known as the Ted lasso of insurance. <laughs> uh, you know, it was brought up to me a couple months ago. Uh, and I wasn't sure if it was a compliment or an insult. So <laughs> I told my wife, we have to watch this show called Ted lasso. And so we did. And uh, after watching the first season, which I thoroughly enjoyed, I took it as a compliment. Uh, um, usually optimistic, uh, excited, look for the best in people. Very rarely uh, do I get confused with the fact that I don't know much about insurance? So um, <laughs> I kind of took it as a compliment. I love it. I love it. It's one of my favorite new shows. And honestly, some of the correlations between you and Ted are pretty <laughs> wild. Um, both had backgrounds in football. Both got into uh, you know a new career in a new world and are having tremendous success. Yeah, it is an interesting correlation. You know, I think it goes back to core values. Mm -hmm. You know, when you watch that show, he spends a lot of time about uh, what he really believes in. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and really when I coach football, when I worked in retail, when I came to insurance, my core values never changed. Mm -hmm. I still believed in creating a foundation of trust, but for it to be real, it had to be evidenced by kind and respectful, but challenging conversations. Mm -hmm. You know, Minnesota, there's this thing called Minnesota nice. Mm -hmm. um, other places you call it being passive aggressive. <laughs> and so we've had to build a culture where people are willing to engage in, in discussion, um, never personal, but certainly direct and pointed so that we can get a committed solution. And ultimately it allows people to hold each other accountable. And then you can actually celebrate the results rather than begrudge them. Chris, you're a Minnesota guy. Can you tell me about 
growing up in Minnesota and how football was first introduced to your life? Yeah, you bet. You know, I grew up in a small town, southwest Minnesota, by the name of Minneota. We we're eight miles from Marshall, which was known as for the home of Schwann's Ice Cream. That was about as big a deal as we had. But my dad was my uh, superintendent of schools. He was my head football coach. He was my choir director. And so really a mentor in my life. But uh, I loved football. He loved music. I loved football. So we kind of met somewhere in the middle. Uh, <laughs> but it was a great football coach, Hall of Famer. We won uh, three straight state titles. We had a lot of success. We set a lot of records in Minnesota high school football, some national records. So uh, I owe a lot to my dad for the way he uh, not only raised me, but coached me and taught me to be optimistic. Dad's cup was never half full. It was always overflowing mm. and everything was an opportunity. And he had a phrase that uh, we'll never lose as long as the game lasts long enough. Uh, and it's really stuck with me no matter what uh, adventure I've taken on his, his mm. words have uh, been meaningful. That's awesome. That's a great quote. Um, and there's no doubt that you were a stud in high school football, I was looking through some of the accolades and correct me if I'm wrong, but you won two um, state championships. And at one point you were like Minnesota player of the year, right? Oh, well, that is accurate. Yeah. So history is right on that. Yeah. Um, yeah. I grew up in an era when mo no one threw the football. And so my dad was a passing guy and Doug Flutie was my, my role model, uh, five, nine and three quarters. Uh, we shared stature. Uh -huh. uh, I tried to model my game after him and I was fortunate enough that my dad let me call my own plays. Um, and so we threw from the one yard line back when people never used to. So a lot of things went our way, small town, small town America, uh, where you could play a lot of sports, but that was a big, big part of our life was that ability to uh, win at Minnesota and, and create mm -hmm. something special. That play calling is super unique for high school football, at least as far as uh, my knowledge and my experience with high school football goes. But I heard a story that maybe even as young as 10, when you'd be driving in the car with your dad, he would say, you know, we're on the 35 yard line and it's first and 10. What player are we calling? Is that story true? That is a true story. It probably started even earlier, but it was, uh, that was our game. We would play and he would give me a situation. I would call the play and he would tell me the result. And then I'd argue with him that there's no way that was incomplete. He was going to be wide open. You were in cover three and, <laughs> You can't cover the out. And I, it went, my mom would roll her eyes, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. uh, but at least she didn't have to talk to me about football. Dad would handle it. But that that's a true story. Mm. And as you move from high school to college, I also read that while you were playing in college, you were also like the offensive coordinator or something for a local high school team. Did I, did I read that right? Or, or that's is another that, true story. Yeah, yeah. My senior year at Bethel, I was playing quarterback on Saturdays and coaching high school on Fridays mm -hmm. um, with Dave Gerke, who was a good friend of mine, just happened to be, it worked out. Fall camp was earlier than we started in, in an odd year. And so I did summer camps for him, put the offense in and then uh, yeah, I'd fax over game plans on Monday and try to hustle over there one night a week. And mm -hmm. uh, it's pretty awesome to be able to, Again, I grew up though doing everything with my dad. Mm -hmm. And so he kind of taught me all, all those things are possible. You don't have to limit yourself to just, just one thing. So tell me about your coaching transition because you coached high school, then college, and then obviously for the NFL, for the Redskins. Can you tell me about how that happened? Yeah. You know, the coaching wasn't what I set out to do. I, um, it kind of happens to you. I think it's much like insurance. Most people totally don't, don't try to go into insurance. They end up there finding how wonderful it is. Uh, but I was coaching in high school uh, while I was working in IT, getting my MBA. When I got my MBA done, Bethel called and asked if I'd be interested to come back as the offense coordinator. And I told my wife, don't worry, honey, two years, I'm out. I'll get it out of my system and we'll go back to business. Well, seven years later, I got the head job at St. Olaf a great little private college in Minnesota. I thought we'd be there forever. Uh, I was 32 years old. Uh, some great mentors there. Uh, my dad came and coached with me. So it was really a special time for our family. And then six years later, uh, Jim Zorn got the head job with the Redskins. And I had known Jim when he was at the University of Minnesota, coaching Corey Sauter, uh, who was a mentee of mine. And uh, we just hit it off. And so in 2008, I had a chance 
to join Jim with the Washington Redskins. And I love St. Olaf. I loved our football team. I loved our players. Uh, but my wife was the one that was convinced um, it was time and that we were going to go where she felt the Lord was leading us. And, and I certainly didn't disagree with it. Was Jim Zorn just totally sold on you from knowing you and knowing your uh, career as a coach and career as a player? Or did you have to interview for the job with Jim Zorn and the Redskins? Yeah, there is no interview process. You know, the NFL is truly who you know. Um, and you just need to know enough about the game, but it's who you know. And and they hire people they trust and they like. And Jim and I had known each other for 15 years. He had followed my career. We'd had quite a bit of offense and success. Um, and so we had clinic together uh, about probably three times in between when he was in Washington uh, with Seattle. And so uh, we just knew each other pretty well. And there's really a strong faith connection, which was the other side of it. And, uh, and so it just worked out. The opportunity came where he was the head coach and uh, he could bring me on the staff. Mm -hmm. You're coaching now at the highest level. You were. Um, Jim Zorn is the head coach. Tell me about your time as the quarterback coach for the Washington Redskins. I mean, that sounds amazing. And I can only imagine what that experience was like. You know, I, I tell people the NFL is a little bit like Oz. You know, from a distance, it's sparkly and looks so great. And then you get there, you pull back curtain, you're like, wow, those offices are kind of <laughs> small. And, and there's a lot of things going on that uh, are, are, aren't um, as good as it looks on TV. But I went trade the experience. Mm -hmm. so I was with some incredible men, uh, some great mentors, Sherman Smith, Joe Bugle, Stump Mitchell, uh, wonderful people in my life and uh, great friends for Virginia. We loved our time in Virginia. The nation's capital, it was uh, tremendous and great fan base. So I wouldn't trade it for anything, but it was a mm -hmm. situation where we weren't good enough. And like many of the preceding coaches there, Dan Snyder let Jim go after two years and mm -hmm. uh, went in a different direction. We're living in a, an odd time right now with the Washington football organization and what's come out with Dan Snyder. And obviously there's a lot of dysfunction in that organization. Did you experience any of that dysfunction when you were there? Well, absolutely. I mean, it was complete dysfunction. And uh, what's come out is what I'd shared with people would come out. Um, that was the culture. You know, coaches were termed paid enemies. Um, and so it created a real discord between, it was, it was uh, between doing your best and being your best and protecting yourself. And that's what I would consider dysfunction. You know, I've learned a lot from a lot of different people. And one thing I learned there is if you want to win long term, you've got to build a foundation of character, integrity, uh, with that trust. It can't be fear. Fear is such a short lived, uh, response. And, uh, so I learned that it was a great learning lesson for me. I also learned that you need to surround yourself with people who don't agree with you all the time. Um, the culture there was one that, uh, Dan had a lot of people that would agree with him and people who didn't, didn't stay around long. And so that creates a toxic, um, situation. And so I learned a lot from it. I really did. Uh, Cause I wasn't just a coach. I was observing the whole thing. That's, that was how I think. I don't think about just my room of three guys. I think about the entire team and the program. I spent time with the front office staff, some great people, wonderful mm -hmm. individuals he had with him, but uh, that culture wasn't one of collaboration and teamwork and trust. Um, that certainly wasn't the situation there. For those that don't know, Dan Snyder has been in some controversy recently and um, John Gruden, the coach of the Raiders, was recently fired based on emails that came out uh, that were going back and forth with the Red Redskins organization. So it's um, a really interesting time for uh, football in Washington. If you were to go back and um, let's just say you were running the organization, is there any changes that you would make right away to uh, the Washington football team and how the culture was built there? Yeah, right away you have to have an understanding of who's in charge. And you also then have to have an understanding of what your role and responsibility is. And the ownership team needs to support a football team and a football staff. Uh, when ownership teams try to run the football team, um, very rarely does it work. You know, the rare case is maybe uh, Jerry Jones, when he, when he stole from the Minnesota Vikings, my hometown Minnesota Vikings, uh, 12 draft picks and players uh, to rebuild his roster. But um, generally it doesn't work. 
Generally, mm -hmm. it works in an organization where you put people in position that are experts at what they're doing, give them protection, uh, give them uh, resources, and let them do their deal. You know, much like the Broad Street model. You know, Rick mm -hmm. Miley brought me in to run Northrest Partners. Rick Miley doesn't get into everyday affairs. He supports me, gives me resources, but then lets me run the organization. And uh, if I need something, we have collaboration. But uh, that is a great model. Find really good people and then let them do their jobs. And mm. uh, generally, that's the best model in athletics as well. You see the most successful franchises, um, they hire great football people, and then they let them do their jobs. It's ironic that you bring up Jerry Jones because we're actually hosting a Cyber Sales Academy at the Cowboys Stadium <laughs> next week. <laughs> so um, the timing couldn't be more on point. But I, I didn't realize the situation with Jerry Jones and the Vikings. What happened with the... Uh, Stealing of the players. Well, Herschel Walker. I mean, the Herschel Walker trade, the worst trade in NFL history. And Jerry mm -hmm. sends, you know, Herschel to the Minnesota Vikings in exchange for draft picks for four seasons and players. And uh, obviously it didn't work out for Minnesota. It, it turned out to be three Super Bowl championships for, for the Dallas Cowboys. So in Minnesota, we're still a little wow. bitter. Patrick, you might be a little young to remember that, uh -huh. but we certainly uh -huh. have not forgotten here in Minnesota. <laughs> Very interesting. Very interesting. Um, well, uh, yeah, we'll see how things go at this event next week. I'm excited. Um, Great stadium. Listen, it's, it is a best in class facility. It's, it's amazing. Good to know. Yeah. Good you'll to have know. a great experience. Yeah. Uh, very excited to do that. So tell, obviously you are no longer coaching in the NFL. Tell me about your transition out of the NFL, how it worked and where you ended up. You know, I, it was interesting. I, I had a great friend in Joel Anderson, who was an alum at St. Olaf and a uh, football alum and uh, came to all my events. And he always told me, if you ever leave St. Olaf, which I hope you don't, but if you do, I'm going to hire you. And we would laugh about it and chuckle. So we're in Washington and season two, uh, not going well. Jim basically had been let go, but he's kept on staff, but wasn't calling plays. And, and Vinny had made some changes and he calls me and says, well, Chris, it looks like I might be hiring you pretty soon. I'm like, really? You see yourself. That's your encouragement here, Joel. Uh, <laughs> but it turned out to be a really encouraging call. And he had taken over half of the United States for Walmart and uh, wanted to bring me in as an executive running uh, uh, market for him in Eastern Wisconsin. And long story short, after a lot of different interviews with a lot of different places where I didn't get jobs that I mm -hmm. thought was going to happen, um, Joel was there and uh, put me in a great position to lead and learn and learn an incredible amount about multi-unit distribution, vendor management, uh, opportunity to get large scale P and L experience, 200 and some people per store over 2,500 employees um, across that area. So it's really a great experience. One which prepared me extremely well to move into this next role as CEO at Northrest Partners, because I had the experience of large scale P and L, had the experience of multi-unit distribution, understood how vendors uh, which is really carriers in our space interact and how you can get to your public uh, most effectively, most mm -hmm. efficiently, understanding how to reduce friction. I mean, those are all the things that became transfer transferable into the insurance space, which at the time, obviously, I had no idea they would. Your stats are really impressive uh, when you look at the improvement that you made to the territory that you're running for Walmart in terms of sales, in terms of, um, I believe you were like the 38th division and you got it up to like number five or something like that. Um, so I guess I'm curious, you're going into a completely different <laughs> industry, a completely different job. You know, you have a lot of great experiences and I'm sure you had unbelievable work ethic, but was there anything specifically that you took from football or just growing up that you brought to Walmart that caused you to be successful in running the region that you were running at Walmart? Yeah, I think there's three things. Uh, one, um, outrageously optimistic that we could do it. You know, a lot of people are looking for hope and when they're not fed hope, they get discouraged. And they, um, if they're constantly under fear and intimidation, um, they, they can't perform well. So I think really that outrageous hope I brought to him. But the second thing is I recruited, I recruited talent nonstop. And most people in those roles were operators. They could tour a store and they could give a lot of notes and tell them to go do these notes. I, mm -hmm. I partnered with our HR team and we recruited a lot of talent. 
Uh, mm -hmm. I think we brought in more assistant managers in that time than anyone else over those four mm -hmm. years. Many of them are store managers now for Walmart, for Target, uh, for Best Buy, a, a number mm -hmm. of different places. So I think the talent process that you learn in football, you know, that term you win with Jimmy's and Joe's, not X's and O's, um, really <laughs> transcends the industries. You need players. You need yeah. talent. Uh, and, and really, that's what really we applies. Did. Yeah. Really applies to the, to the San Francisco 49ers with <laughs> Jimmy's and Joe's. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> and then number three was really simplifying what, what's complicated. You know, we had a phrase that what's simple is understood and what's understood is executed. And that's in football, it's in retail, it's in insurance. Mm -hmm. We can certainly over overcomplicate things, but it certainly doesn't lead to winning. It just makes you feel good on a whiteboard. But if you can simplify it where people can execute, uh, your chance of winning goes way up. And I'm sure you're entering a Walmart situation where you had other folks that were trying to climb the corporate ladder. Did you ever feel insecure about your knowledge of you know retail stores in general or how Walmart worked? And if so, how did you respond to that insecurity? Yeah, you have the question about it being insecure. Listen, I, every industry I've gone in, I've been the least knowledgeable person. So I become comfortable uh, being uncomfortable. And I don't spend a lot of time worrying about what I don't know. I'm a stud student of the game. It doesn't matter what game I'm studying, I'll learn. Uh, I'm a fast adapter. Mm. But I don't let what I don't know hinder what I do know. And what I do mm. know is leading people and giving them inspiration and hope. And I know how to understand complicated things and make it simple. And so I don't change that formula. I learned that again at an early age from my dad. Um, you know, don't let people bring you down about what you don't know. Maximize what you do know, um, mm. and then make an impact on people. So that part never changed for me, Patrick. So yep. that's why I was able to transfer it. There are days, of course, mm -hmm. when you're struggling because some people know more things than you. But that's a great life lesson. Uh, mm. There's always someone that knows more than you. Someone that does something better doesn't mean that you can uh, back away from making an impact though. Mm -hmm. For your talent acquisition strategy that you kind of took from your football career with identifying talent in the corporate world, was there any, any specifics that you put into that talent recruitment strategy when you're looking for someone that you could trust um, to put into a management situation or someone that you knew would succeed? Was there any strategy that you had there? Yeah, it's interesting you ask because I, I was having a discussion just yesterday about this, that we have to require uh, culture first and character. And if we recruit character and culture, we can bring and develop some skill sets. Now, you have to be adequate, but if you're not a culture fit and you're not a character fit, I don't mm. care how good you are, you're going to fail and you're going to mm. bring people down with you. Um, and so that's what we've stuck with, culture and character. And you have to have some proficiency. So to be a salesperson, if you're scared to get a, make get on the phone, well, you can't do that job. Um, but if you have those things and don't let go of it and mm. don't compromise, I think you can build a great organization, a great football team, a great store, a great retail outlet. Um, because character will always override uh, what someone thinks they know because they'll tell the truth. And if they mm -hmm. fit your culture and they're going to give the work ethic that the rest of your team gives, you got a real chance. We do the same thing in terms of looking for culture fits, um, culture first. We actually just recently had an internal company event that was all about building the correct culture in, Perfect, um, yeah. in Nashville. It was like a first in-person event. <laughs> um, but in terms of figuring out if a person is a fit for that culture, are you integrating specific questions into the interview process or are you looking at previous history, like certain, certain roles people may have had to identify if they are a culture fit or any personality testing? What, what specifics go into making sure they're the right culture fit first? Yeah, you know, we, we do a lot of vetting through the interview process, obviously, but really I talk to them about our core values and really ask them if they align. Are you willing to build a foundation of trust and will it be evidenced by this kind and respectful but challenging conversations? And, and can you give me examples of that where you're willing to challenge something and still be friends? You know, we're in a society right now where people think if you disagree with someone's opinion, you have to be enemies. And it's just a false precept. But yet it's something that's preached and it's something that our media continues to proliferate. Mm. And we're going to end that. We're not going to be like the world around us. And so we are going to be able to have respectful, challenging conversations where we can go away committed. And the mm. other piece is, piece, are they willing to be servant leaders? We talk about servant leadership every day. 
service to each other, service to our clients and service to our communities. And they have to resonate with that. That has to mean something to them. Um, the idea of serving that rather than being serviced. So if someone's selfish and it's all about themselves, it's not going to work out with us. Um, so you had to build a foundation of, of trust and you have to be able to understand what it means uh, to be a servant leader. And if they can kind of pass that test with our mm. teams and it resonates with them, um, that's, those are the people that will, will move on and um, will take a risk on, even if they don't have industry experience, because we think they can grow into being an exciting uh, part of us. Mm -hmm. And I know you've brought a lot of those values in terms of culture and in terms of putting the right team together to the insurance world. I think it's be a good time to learn more about how you went from the success you had at Walmart to North Risk Partners in the insurance world. How did that transition happen? Uh, so how I got here was a great story in and of itself. A friend from 25 years ago, um, who was actually the first babysitter for my twins, uh, and he put my son's diaper on backwards, was a partner. <laughs> he's a great risk advisor, best in class. And he's a partner in the firm that Broad Street had acquired, and they were merging. And he called and said, would you have any interest in coming over and looking at our operation? We, we're not sure how to put this together. We need someone who can help operate. And obviously you've done this type of stuff. And so I really came in uh, with that in mind. Uh, Rick Miley hired me. I became chief operating officer and six months later became the CEO. And really, again, the same founding principles as a head coach. Hire great staff members, great coordinators. Let them coordinate. Don't micromanage them. Hire great people. I have a great CFO that I, that I inherited and she's an incredible woman and leader. And so the, we just kept building out our leadership team around the same core values. We didn't change our core values. We didn't change the servant leadership model. Uh, and then I recruited, I recruit both talent and agencies. And so over seven years, I've done 40 transactions. We've gone from 100 employees to now 425 as of this morning. Um, but we haven't changed again, what we believe in. We've just looked, found more people that want to be part of what we're doing and wanted to add energy to um, our efforts. It's really impressive growth. When you got to Northwest Partners, had they already been acquired by Broad Street? Yeah, so Rick, Rick uh, at Broad Street had acquired Seal Brown first, then Apollo okay. Insurance in St. Cloud, then in 2013, Johnson McCann Benefits. So there are okay. three separate transactions. It was end of 2013 when Broad Street said, okay, make this into a company. And they came up with the name Northwest Partners. Mm -hmm. And then I came on the scene in 2014 when that had just occurred. We've connected with some folks at Broad Street and they have been incredibly nice, incredibly um, easy to deal with and could not be more professional. So that's, that's been my personal experience with Broad Street. Has it been interesting being a part of, you know, I think Broad Street, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe they're like top 10 retail insurance agencies in the country. Um, how is it, first of all, I'd love to know if that's true, but also how is it building culture in, um, you know, a piece of a much larger organization? Yeah, no, that's a great question. And, and to answer your first question, yes, they are. Roll up is nearly a billion dollars of revenue now. Wow. Um, it, being part of a, a bigger piece is really, for me, exciting uh, because I have my objectives that I wanted our position within the Broad Street Corps. Uh, but Rick has really built a culture and Ken Kirk has built on that. Um, really the antithesis of what I was describing earlier and that they don't micromanage. They do let you do your job. They give you resources. They give you capital. They give you accountants and lawyers to help you do your job from an M&A standpoint. But then they, they step back and let you lead your business. Um, so that's really, for me, been such a breath of fresh air coming from the experience of Washington, the, then the experience of Walmart. Um, to where they truly let you do lead the way you want to lead. And for me, that was a big deal uh, with my, um, my personality and my beliefs um, that I could be in that kind of place. I didn't really believe it at first. I didn't think it was possible that someone would invest that kind of money in you and in an acquisition, but then just let you lead it. Um, mm -hmm. But they've been nothing but uh, truthful. And they are. It's, they're a great group, kind, respectful, um, but really encouraging, I would say, is the greatest gift they give. Uh, and yeah, of course, you have to deliver results because we all answer to someone, but um, it's more than that. I think there's a deep trust 
uh, that they have in their cores and they really allow us to collaborate. So there's six of us have calls every two weeks, six of the largest cores, wonderful men that I've learned an incredible amount from, um, mm -hmm. where they've taught me a lot about insurance and how they run their agencies. So, you know, without that core group that I get to be part of every two weeks, there's no way we have the success we've had. You got, in, you got promoted incredibly fast. I think you said six months. What, what would you credit that quick success to from going from COO to CEO so fast? It, it was kind of the plan that, that I had mapped out with Rick that uh, I could come in and turn things around operationally, turn it into a profitable enterprise. But if, we, if wow. I did that, we would have to make that switch pretty early. They had taken mm -hmm. one of the principals who was on the tail end of his career, named him CEO initially, but that wasn't the long-term plan. Um, they needed someone else that could really do it over a longer term. Um, and so it was really a great transition um, where I was able to step in, prove it, and then step into role and uh, accelerate. It really seems like a theme of your career has been establishing really strong relationships that have come through in amazing ways down the line. Yeah, I think that is true. And I, again, I'll go back to faith for most of it. Mm -hmm. You know, I think the Lord gifts us in different ways. And for me, it's uh, connecting with people and making an impact on them and really trying to give them hope that they might not have had before they met you. That's really my mission. And so with connecting with people, when you see them that way, it's not about what they can do for me, but what can we do together? Uh, and I think that's how it's happened. And, and, different personality types hit it off and uh, insurance seems to have a lot of people that I can hit it off with. It's been a, a great, great career transition for me. You mentioned that some of your job is acquiring agencies or different insurance entities. Is that what's making up the bulk of your day to day at the moment? Well, you know, it started out as all culture and infrastructure. That's what it started with. But then as time went on, uh, I spent a lot of time, probably half my time on merger and acquisition. So I'm either recruiting talent, so I'm acquiring talent, or I'm acquiring another agency. And those are really the bulk of it. And then the other part is uh, strategy and culture. That's really what I spend my time on in those quadrants. Because uh, again, it's still about talent. So reinforce talent you have, but go find more talent. So I have lunch and uh, dinner with a lot of prospects, whether it's an agency or whether it's top talent that I've met and that I know and that mm -hmm. I believe uh, would be a good addition to our team. Well, if you ever need any introductions, uh, <laughs> the, last, the last count that we just checked was Evolve is working with about 3,000 wow. retail insurance agencies across the country when it comes to cyber risk specifically. Tremendous. So, um, yeah, if there's any collaboration we could ever do on cyber, we're very open to it. You but, bet. Hey, cyber is um, a big topic right now. Uh, there's not mm -hmm. a lot of capacity out there. And so uh, we're all looking for partners who are experts in that space at this time. That's for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Um, okay, cool. Well, I mean, obviously a tremendous journey from the NFL to Walmart <laughs> to the insurance world. Do you see yourself sticking around in the insurance game for – the foreseeable future? This is by far my favorite job, uh, my favorite industry. I still have nightmares awesome. that I'm coaching and I wake <laughs> up and tell my wife, honey, no matter what I say, don't let me do it. Uh, <laughs> I love our team. I love our people. I love the group we have at Broad Street. I love what we've built. So anyone who's not in the insurance industry, it's simply a case they don't understand it. They don't mm -hmm. understand what we do, how we do it, the impact we make. Uh, the great joy we can have in the day-to-day -day work we do. Uh, it's been one of the great blessings of my life and our family's life, the fact that uh, we made this transition and we made this jump. That validation is so cool to hear from someone that's come from the world of professional sports into the insurance industry. I think a lot of people, you know, we've seen a lot of people come into the insurance industry and I really think a lot of them take it for granted in terms of, the way that it works, what you get to do every day, the relationships that you build. You know, like we mentioned that, you know, some key moments in your career, you've had great relationships that have really made a strong impact on the rest of your life. I mean, that's day to day for us, building relationships with the brokers that we work with is one of the most fun things to do to bond with them. Um, you know, we have our sales academy, but in general with our offices across the country, um, focusing on those relationships makes it such a unique industry and giving 
business owners products that they absolutely need. And in our world, you know, education is such a big factor. So yeah. I'm with you. You're right on. I'm with you're, you on that. We're, we're, we are what allows businesses to do what they do. Without us, mm -hmm. they can't function. Uh, we mm -hmm. rebuild them when terrible things happen. Uh, we, we're there when there's disaster strikes. We become their trusted advisor, their good friend. Uh, I love it. I love the relationship and the technical side to ensure mm -hmm. they have the right products at the right time, at the right place to cover their needs. Uh, there is, mm -hmm. it's, it's a noble profession. And, and I hope there's more people that we could keep educating. And I credit you for what you're doing to educate and train and teach. And guys like me need to keep recruiting. And we need to keep finding talent mm -hmm. as they come out of college to understand that the insurance industry is vast and it's complicated, it's exciting, it's fast paced, mm -hmm. it's changing. Uh, and so we can get more and more talent to think about us as their yeah. first choice. That was definitely one of our goals in starting this podcast is creating a platform where we could put the insurance industry on the map and really bring value to what we felt was an underserved audience with the insurance world. Um, and like, frankly, you know, bringing the Ted Lasso of insurance to the podcast <laughs> is pretty darn That's epic. That's funny. That's great. Well, um, I appreciate what you're doing. It's, it's making a difference. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, so I got to ask, Chris, is there any temptation to you know, coach high school football on the side, you know, on the weekends and after work, is there any temptation to uh, get back into football? Well, bit? if we're going to be completely honest, I've got my brother-in-law's out at Hutchinson and one of my best friends and mentors in life, Dwight Lundin's at Becker. And so mm -hmm. I do, I, I do do a little dabbling. I, I send them some plays mm -hmm. and take snapshots. And uh, when my wife's out of town, I do a little coaching uh, just every now and again. <laughs> so I dabble enough. Uh, to keep it at bay. And uh, they're men that I love and respect and uh, who make a huge impact in their community. So I love to support them yeah. and encourage them. Yeah, that's so cool. Um, well, Chris, thank you again for coming on. I really, truly look forward to the time when we meet in person um, because I think there's a lot of different areas where we could collaborate. And um, I think that you're uh, just a great mentor in general. I also think this would be a good time. So we always end every episode with five rapid fire questions that you can answer as short or as long as you'd like. <laughs> so if you're ready, we can dive in. All right. Okay. So a lot of these questions are NFL based and I have to say I'm a big, as you know, San Francisco 49ers fan, but I'm curious. And we had um, some support from the audience in crafting these questions as well. To start off, who is your favorite quarterback in the NFL right now? Yeah, you know, if I had to pick just one uh, at this time, despite a little bit of a leg this season, I still think Patrick Mahomes, between arm strength, athleticism, intelligence, still brings the most to the field. Uh, he needs a little bit of protection, uh, but I would still take Pat Mahomes number one right now. Pat Mahomes, very cool. We had, uh, I was actually just at the Chiefs Bills game in Kansas City. It seems like the Chiefs defense needs a little work as well. And their offensive line, but he's he's yeah. the real deal, I think. Yeah. Okay. Okay. In sports in general, who do you think is the best leader and why? Well, that's a great question. And there's a lot of great leaders out there. Of course, I'm an I'm an NFL guy. Um, what Tom Brady's done over his uh, his history, his resume is tremendous. You know, mm -hmm. I think what makes Tom a great leader, not only is he a student of the game, he holds others accountable to it, but he doesn't hold them to a level above what he holds himself. And so I think as a leader, he's putting in the time, he's doing the work both physically, mentally, emotionally. He's giving everything he's got and he rises up to the occasion and then he brings his team up with him. And I think that's a sign of a great leader when those around him rise up and play uh, at the highest level they've played. And that's what he does consistently. When he's on the field, he makes a lot of guys look like they're Hall of Famers. Um, but it's because of what he brings, I think, from a leadership standpoint. He's the GOAT. There's no question about it. Also happens to be a Bay Area native. Oh, yeah. yeah. And uh, an alumni of uh, one of my high school rivals, uh, the Sarah Padres. <laughs> no kidding. So shout out to the SI Wildcats <laughs> in San Francisco. <laughs> Is I know you mentioned a few learning lessons from football that applied to business later on, but is there one learning lesson from your football career that has been most helpful to you 
in the business world? You know, I got benched in college and uh, it was, I'd never gotten benched in my life. And we we're down 10 to six. I uh, slipped on one throw, missed another throw, got benched. And I felt like, you know, we're going to win. I'm in great position. We're going to, I'll hit a bunch of throws second half and I get benched. Don't get put in and we lose the game. Um, and that's a terrible experience to go through, but what a great experience to learn how to get back up um, the next day and go to church and get back and uh, Monday and get back to film and get back to work and learning how not to tie yourself just to that accomplishment or just to that, your job and who you are. And it was really a good early lesson as a 20 year old kid to um, remind myself, I'm not just a football player. That's not my identity. You know, my identity is in Christ and it's in how I treat people and what I do. And so uh, that lesson hasn't left me because we do fall down a lot in business. We fall down a lot of times in, in life. And uh, the question is, how do you respond? Not if you're going to get knocked down or get benched or whatever the case, how do you respond? And uh, hopefully as we mature and learn, we do it better and better. But it, it, I, I was fortunate. I got the experience early, although not pleasant at the time, I think has led to a pretty uh, fruitful harvest. Who is your favorite football team in the NFL? Well, I'm a Minnesota Vikings guy. I grew up as a kid uh, cheering for the Vikings, crying every time they lost the Super Bowl when I was, you know, single digit age. I have got good friends with a lot of teams, so I cheer on a lot of teams, but uh, I'm still true and true a Vikings fan. I'll be at the U.S. Bank Stadium Sunday night of Halloween, watch him take on the hated Dallas uh -huh. Cowboys. Uh, uh -huh. So it's sure to be a great night. That's what I was thinking you'd say. <clears throat> Okay, final question. This question is a little bit biased. Jimmy G or Trey Lance? Okay, Trey Lance is from Marshall, Minnesota, eight miles from my hometown. Okay. Um, so I can't vote against a small town Minnesota kid. Uh, Trey is <laughs> going to bring incredible athleticism. He has to learn the NFL game and the speed of the game. You know, when you're at NDSU and you run the play action, guys are pretty open. So you're throwing mm -hmm. to open receivers in the NFL. You're throwing to the open space, anticipating the receiver being there. So it's mm -hmm. just a difference for him, but he's a great kid, a great athlete, great arm can really run. Um, I think he will be a great quarterback in the NFL. Hopefully he's in the right mm -hmm. system with the right amount of time to learn the things he needs to learn. Uh, but Jimmy's a great player, but you know, he's, he's just had a hard time staying healthy. Um, and then at times he's, he's, he's not been, um, won as many games as his stats might suggest. I think Trey Lance could be a great quarterback. And I think you're fortunate to have him where you have him because he'll be surrounded by pretty good players mm. and good coaches. I'm on team Trey too. <laughs> uh, we've seen Jimmy for a while. I think the stat that I heard that was so frustrating was like six for 36 on third downs. So, um, yeah, anyways, and I, I think this could be a good year to, work out the kinks and uh, get him a little bit more experience. Could be. So that's why they pay Kyle the big bucks to make that decision. <laughs> right. Right. Well, um, anyways, Chris go Niners. Um, we'll see how the Vikings do, but i um, really glad that we were connected through broad street. i um, very excited to see if there's anything we can do together in the future. And I'm very excited as well for the audience of insurance professionals that's out there to get more exposure to someone like yourself who's had incredible success in different industries and has an extremely unique perspective um, on the insurance industry. And I just love how much you value it because there's so many people I think that take it for granted or they're on the outside looking in and they don't understand how cool of an industry we're actually in. So, Anyways, Chris, that said, I will plan on talking to you soon, but we will uh, wrap up this podcast right here. All right, Patrick, appreciate the time. Really enjoyed spending time with you. Look forward to meeting as well. Thanks, Chris. This episode of the podcast is sponsored by Varuna. Varuna is the future agency management system built on the number one customer relationship management tool in the world, Salesforce. Varuna allows you to customize your system Workflows, reports, dashboards, and minutes allows you to gain actionable insights in your business in real time, letting you use this intelligence to grow your business in multiples. Varuna allows you to know your business so that you can grow your business. Please visit varuna.com to learn more.